With smouldering good looks and a strong athletic presence, Laurence Olivier had a reputation as the greatest actor of the 20th century. In films like Wuthering Heights and Rebecca, he raised the acting bar to new levels. And for years, he led a life of high drama off the screen too, with a tempestuous marriage to Vivian Lee, making him half of one of Hollywood's original super couples. Olivier was the youngest actor to ever be knighted and the first to become a life peer, but famously insisted on being called not Sir, not Lord, but simply Larry. His acting talent and his future destiny were both apparent from an early age, which is something he talks about in this interview. First on location at the Old Vic Theatre, and then later from the BBC Studios on the programme Great Acting with Kenneth Tynan. When you were 10 years old, Ellen Terry said, the boy who plays the part of Brutus is already a great actor. Can you remember playing Brutus? Oh, yes, I do. I do indeed. My father had a story about Forbes Robertson. I never believed it, but my father used to tell it, so I'll tell it for what it's worth. I don't know what it's worth in truth, but he said that he met Forbes Robertson on that occasion. And as he put it, Forbes Robertson had tears in his eyes when my father said, my little boy isn't bad, is he, or something. And um, he said that Forbes Robertson said, my dear man, he is Brutus, he said. <laughs> Well, I don't see how I can have been at 10, but still. Uh, your father he, was a high Anglican clergyman. He was a high Anglican clergyman. Did he have a great deal of influence on your life? Oh, yes. Life? Oh, yes, very much, very much. You see, both my brother and I started, uh, at least with a great sense of ritual. And it was these elaborate rituals that gave you the idea, perhaps, of acting? Yes. Oh, yes, and my father's great uh, prowess in the, uh, in the pulpit. Did your father approve of you going on the stage? Well, as a matter of fact, Although my relationship with him had been extremely distant all my youth, I was terrified of him. He was a very frightening father figure, Victorian father figure. I absolutely worshipped and adored my mother, who died when I was 13 years old, and I, I often think and say that I, perhaps I've never got over it. Anyway, my father had to take over, not knowing me very much. I think to him I was rather an unnecessary child. He, I, I, I don't blame him at all because I was probably very fat and absolutely brainless. But finally, when my brother went to India as an Indian rubber planter, not as an Indian rubber planter, but as an English <laughs> rubber planter in India, I was filled with the glamour of what my brother was doing. And when we'd seen him off on his boat in Tilbury, we got back home to Letchworth, where my father was rector. I said, well, when can I follow Dickie out to India, father, please? about one or two years. I don't want to go to the university. And my father said, you're talking nonsense. You're going to be an actor. And this was a complete surprise to you? Yes, it was. I was amazed that he'd, A, that he'd thought things out for me at all, and B, that he'd thought things out that far. Uh, and that he'd had the, I secretly knew that he was right, that I ought to be an actor. Have you find it difficult to find bits of yourself in the evil characters you played? What you need to make up your makeup as an actor, is uh, observation, intuition. You must, at its most highfalutin, uh, the ex most highfalutin expression of it, the actor is as important as the illuminator of the human heart. He's as important as the psychiatrist or the doctor, minister, if you like. That's putting him very high and mightily. At the opposite end of that pole, you've got to find in the actor a man who will not be too proud to scavenge that tiniest little bit of human circumstance. Observe it, use it, find it, use it sometime or another. I've frequently observed things, and thank God, if I haven't got a very good memory for anything else, but I've got a memory for little details. And I've had things in my back of my mind for as long as 18 years before I've used them. And the, perhaps in those little tiny things, maybe the key to a whole characterization. We're going to look now at a scene from the film of Richard III. It's the scene after Richard has successfully made love to the widow of one of his victims. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? 
Was ever woman in this humor one? My dukedom to a widow's chastity, I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life, she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a mopper man. I be at charges for a looking glass and entertain some score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favor with myself, I will maintain it to some little cost. Shine out, fair sun, till I have bought a glass that I may see my shadow as I pass. Did you know at the time that that was going to be one of the key performances of your career? No. No. A lot of things contributed to what I said, talking about scavenging just now. One thing that may lead an actor to be successful in a part, it may, not always, but may, is to try to be unlike somebody else in it. At the time when I took over that part, first of all, Donald Wolfitt had made an enormous success in the part, only 18 months previously. And I didn't want to play the part at all, because I thought it was much too close to this colleague's success. And uh, I had seen it. And when I was learning it, I could hear nothing but Donald's voice in my mind's ear, and uh, see nothing but him in my mind's eye. And so I thought, this won't do. I've, I've just got to think of something else. Well, my first thought, I'd, I'd always had images, pictures. I'd heard imitations of old actors um, imitating Henry Irving. And so I did right away an imitation of these old actors imitating Henry Irving's voice. That's why I took that on a sort of narrow kind of vocal address. Then I thought about looks. And I thought about the big bad wolf. And I thought about a director under whom I had suffered an extremist in New York called Jed Harris. The physiognomy of the Big Bad Wolf was said to have been founded upon Jed Harris. And so, hence the nose, which originally was very much bigger than it was finally in the film. And so, with one or two extraneous externals, I began to build up a character, a characterization. I'm afraid I do work, mostly from the outside in. I usually collect whether consciously or unconsciously, I usually collect a lot of details, a lot of characteristics, and find a creature swimming about somehow in the middle of them. Your excursions into contemporary plays, things like The Sleeping Prince by Mr. Rattigan, John Osborne's The Entertainer. I adore The Entertainer. I think it's the most wonderful part that I've ever played. Uh, let's have a look now at a scene from The Entertainer film. It's a scene in which the... Uh, uh, middle-aged and unsuccessful musical comic Archie uh, uh, Rice, knowing that his career is coming to an end, talks to his daughter on the empty stage of an empty seaside theatre where they're performing. You think I'm just a tatty old musical actor? <laughs> you know, uh, when you're up here, when you're up here, you think you love all those people around you out there. But you don't. You don't love them. Like. Oh, if you learn it properly, you get yourself a technique. And smile, Don, you smile and look the friendliest, jolliest thing in the world. But you'll be just as dead and used up just like everybody else. You see this face? This face can split open with warmth and humanity. It can sing, tell the worst unfunniest stories in the world to a great mob of dead, drab irks. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because look. Look at my eyes. I'm dead behind these eyes. I'm dead. 
Just like the whole damn shoddy lot out there. Archie Rice was influenced by a Negro blues singer. Is there, are there any actors who've influenced you to that degree? Yes, lots of them. I've mentioned Fairbanks, Barrymore, whose Hamlet I first saw when I was 17 years old. Um, Noel Coward, in this way, influenced me a great deal. He lent me a very stern professionalism. Of all people I've ever watched with the greatest delight, I think, was in another field entirely with Sid Field. I wouldn't like anybody to think that I was imitating Sid Field when I was doing The Entertainer. Well, because, there were little uh, things in it. Little things, but Sid Field was a great comic, and this man is a lousy one. But I know when I imitate Sid Field now, to this day, I still borrow from him, freely and unashamedly. I watch... I had... Um, I watch all my colleagues very carefully, admire them all for different qualities which they have. And it's, I think, the most interesting thing to see is that an actor is most successful when not only all his virtues, but all his disadvantages come into useful play in a part. Laurence Olivier's first love was always the stage, which perhaps explains why his move into films in the 1930s wasn't easy. It had taken two attempts to crack Hollywood before his talents were able to fully flourish. In this interview from Line Up Film Night, we see him talking about that journey and how he eventually combined roles of film producer, director and actor. When you began to make a name for yourself in the West End in the early 30s, it was rather surprisingly not in classical roles at all, but in light comedy and rather matinee idol parts. One thinks of... of the fact that you played opposite Noel Coward in Private Lives, that you played Beau Geste. Not really end. opposite Noel Coward, but it was alongside him, <laughs> way down the corridor too. But um, I'd done uh, quite some juvenile leading roles, I suppose you'd call them, from about 1928 to uh, 1930, that sort of thing. And then I joined up with Noel in Private Lives and played that terrible part, Victor Prynne which I must say he's had the decency to apologise about since. <laughs> and uh, it was very exciting to be in a hit for the first time. I mean, with two such glamour figures as Gertie Lawrence and Noel, you can imagine how, how glorious it was. And then we went to New York with it. And then it was in New York while we were playing there that uh, my, wife, my first wife, Jill, was in the play then. And she and I signed up with Hollywood and we, we had uh, little not terribly demanding approaches from all the studios, but the one we chose was RKO, because the, that was sold us by the lady who sold the idea to us because that was the youngest studio, and it was better for youngish people to belong to a younger studio. I don't think it worked out at all. I did three pictures in two years. And the first of it, first of which was an extraordinary thing, I would hate to see it now. It was called Friends and Lovers, with um, Adolf Monju, Adolf, as he was called, Lily Damita, Eric von Stroheim, and myself. And then I played two other films there but in two years. That's all I did, and came back home rather in disgust. But of course, they had, the, they had that the terrible Wall Street crash, uh, and the film industry had uh, gone through a fearsome time. I did start about three or four other pictures, but about the second day, little men with black coats and spectacles would come down onto the floor and say, that's it, it's all, wrap it up. And then, when you went back to Hollywood, uh, towards the end of the 30s, of course, you began to make tremendous successes in films like Rebecca and Wuthering Heights. Did oh, that, that change the whole picture yes. of Hollywood for you? The man who changed Hollywood for me, and the whole idea of that, I was very snobbish about films. I did them to make money and said so, all over the place, much to the disgust of the Sam Goldwoods of this world. But um, the man who changed me was the man I quarreled with most bitterly of all, really, and that was William Wyler. And, uh, You'd be amazed at the scenes between Merle and myself and Willie Wyler that took <coughs> place beneath that heart-throbbing romance called Wuthering Heights. You'd be amazed <laughs> at the temperament and the spit and the fury and the passion and the rages with each other that we went through. And uh, he, uh, we were very anarchic with each other on the floor, but it was he who said, persuaded me, simply with patient talking. He wasn't a pleasant director to talk 
to, to work with, but he was a very interesting man to talk to. He was much more coherent off the floor than on it, but he, he told me that I must understand there wasn't anything that could not be done in that medium if you found the way to do it. And it was he who persuaded me that you could even do Shakespeare successfully on a film. When I came to make Wuthering Heights, I'm sorry, Henry V, and uh, he was a major in the army, staying at Claridge's Hotel, which so many majors in the American army seemed able to do. And um, I asked him if he would direct Henry V, and he said, well, it's sweet of you, no thanks, I can't. He said, you better do it yourself. And so that's the way it turned out. But if it hadn't been for him, I'd never have thought of making it. And is it true that before him and before Wuthering Heights, you had in fact been turned down for the lead opposite Greta Garbo in Queen Christina? Yes, that's true. But she was right. I wasn't up to her standard at all. Um, I, hadn't got, I hadn't got the stature necessary to be her leading man, anything like. She was absolutely right. She was very sweet to me years later and sort of... Uh, I had apologetic messages through George Cukor and people, and I said, please tell her she was absolutely right. I wasn't, a, I wasn't, couldn't hold a candle to her. I was too young for her. I was about two or three years younger. I was very light. I was only about 25, I think. And um, she was not light. She had immense personality, colossal experience, tremendous presence, and was a great, great artist and completely understood every single thing that was to be thought or understood about her medium. She was the mistress of it, queen of it. I didn't know anything about it. I, well, little, 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 but what I knew was no match for her. She was quite right to fire me, because I nearly cut my throat with, and nearly threw myself out of windows afterwards, because it was very highly publicized, as you can imagine, at the time. However, one gets over these things. And when you came in more successful years to make Henry V and Hamlet and Richard III, those three films over which you had control not just as actor but also as director, yes. they are the three, I think, for which you will be always remembered. Is that just coincidence or is it always better to have one actor in charge of one film? Well, I think it had not been done very much except by Orson Welles, marvellously and masterfully in, in Citizen Kane. And uh, that film in which he really made a landmark in films that really was a landmark. And it was a m marvelous, uh, Herculean task he undertook and fulfilled brilliantly. And he was the subject of great admiration and absolutely unstinted admiration, I'm sure, the world over, except possibly in his own country, where um, people who likened themselves to the character he played were a little bit offended about it. But in the realm of film, I mean, Orson's name will go down to posterity, I'm sure, as being one of the masters. And uh, I suppose in England, I suppose I was about the first actor to, to produce and direct his own films. I, I think I was. I'm, I wouldn't like to swear that, but I think I was. Mm. Do you think you learned much from him directly in terms of, of acting and directing, or was it just Oh, no, I think, thing? no, I didn't mean that. No. Um, his style, he created a style in uh, Citizen Kane, which you can say if you like. Um, I wouldn't mind anybody saying I sort of copied in Hamlet, um, in that it, it uh, during that, Greg Toland developed this uh, deep focus work, which had never been done before. As a matter of fact, I was in the very first deep focus shot ever when Greg Toland was photographing Wuthering Heights. And uh, at the end of a certain take, which was Merle in the foreground and what we call a three shot here, and I was full length in the background. And um, he said, uh, did you notice anything about that shot? And I said, uh, no. I, knew, I could bet my bottom dollar that Miss Oberon was in focus, and I wasn't, <laughs> that's all. And he said, um, you're wrong about that. That's a new sort of shot. Didn't you feel your key light very strong? I said, well, yes, I think I did, no. Yeah. You wait till the rushes. You mean I shall be in focus and Miss Oberon will be, yeah. And that was the very first shot he'd ever tried it with. And that also was Wyler. And Wyler was always with, um, always had Greg Tolan with him. And Orson very wisely took Greg Tolan. Now, there were a lot of shots in Hamlet 
this is what is final, and we're getting to the point. There are a lot of shots in Hamlet which had very deep focus indeed, very deep focus carriage. There was one shot of little Jean Simmons, as she was then, the back of her head showing every hair in focus, just right in the foreground, and I was through a mirror 120, 120 feet away as Hamlet, and also pin sharp. And that was the style. And I, I wouldn't like to say I would have thought of that style if it hadn't been for Orson. Three years after that interview, Olivier took on a role that would become one of his and the public's favorites, starring alongside Michael Caine in the classic thriller, Sleuth. Here's a report from the film set, again by interviewer Sheridan Morley. Okay, it's all right. While the Sleuth team were filming at Athelhampton, we went to watch them at work, and I had a number of tries at getting a few words with one of the film's co-stars, Laurence Olivier, but he needed some persuading. It's an invasion of privacy. <laughs> the other star of Sleuth is Michael Caine, playing a part which, it's fair to say, is far above and beyond anything he's previously tried to do in ten years of film stardom. We'll we get this before lunch, Joe. <laughs> Together, Olivier and Kane form a screen partnership which those who've already seen the film in America say is electric. Uh, in terms of the sheer length of your part, has Sleuth been a very difficult film for you? It's <laughs> absolutely terrible. It's been it's really very long. I didn't have time to learn it. I was terribly busy at the National. I didn't have time to learn it before we started. And really, that's the only thing to do. What I'd love to have had time to do was to have... Um, taken it on a baby road tour or something if they would allow me to for, and played it for four weeks and uh, possibly with michael on the stage oh yes it would be marvelous made a little bit of dough we'd have known we'd have known all the thoughts then we'd have known all the different colors we'd have known the signals along the line we'd have known why we did something because something followed and why to avoid doing something because it would be obvious if we did it in such a way because something else followed you know all sorts of things that concern an actor all the time and uh, it's, it's been a great effort to learn it. I don't think I've let the production team down more than once or twice by just frankly not being able to learn it. It's very, my part is very hard because very clever author Tony Schaffer, as he is, has written it as an author speaking in the way that an author would like to speak. And therefore that's not quite a, a, a very colloquial way of speaking. It's always rather, the mot juste is always just round the corner, and there's a plenty of alliterative occasions, which um, are always probably hard for the author to find in the first place. He's got to sort of find it. Therefore, you've got to find it. It's not the word immediately that brings to mind, however, that those alliterative things are always difficult. You know, I haven't congratulated you yet on your uh, game. Oh. It was jolly good. You really think so? Go on. <laughs> Must say, I was rather delighted with it myself. I say, did you really think your last moment on Earth had come? Yes. You're not cross, are you? Cross? I don't understand. That's one of your words. Look, as I explained to you, when you were playing Doppler, I had to test your metal to see if, as I suspected, you really were my sort of person. A games playing sort of person? Exactly. And am I? There's no question about it. Compare your experience this weekend, my dear Milo, with any other moment in your life. Now, if you're honest with yourself, you'll have to admit that you live more intensely in my company than in anybody else's. Now, even with Marguerite, look, we know what it is to play a game, you and I. That's so rare. Two people brought together, equally matched, having the courage and the talents to make of life a continuing charade of bright fancy, happy invention, to face out its emptiness and its terrors by playing, by just playing. Stand over it. Larry, whom I've known for many, many years, of course, I've never had the opportunity of working with, but remains the dream choice to play uh, Andrew Wyke. Uh, understood the character completely. 
little bits of Andrew Wack always reminded Larry and me of people we'd actually known. Uh, and most, most importantly, in Larry, I had this incredible uh, Comstock load of, of experience and, and uh, uh, his, his absolute total command of every form of human expression and, and projection uh, to help keep the, the, the constant interplay of these two characters uh, exciting. In other words, uh, no two scenes could be played alike. Uh, this childlike, uh, grown-up man who was constantly going off into little fantasies, playing detectives, playing parts of charwomen. Uh, Larry, with his tremendous store of experience, you see, I mean, he does everything from a regi a restoration rake uh, to a 20th century charwoman in the film, and does it almost en passant in the characterization. And um, this is something uh, you, you, can't, uh, you can't do neo-realistically. You can't go find someone off the street to do it. Bloody well, it better be as close to Laurence Olivier as you can get. But having Laurence Olivier playing Andrew Wyke must be fair competition for you. Is there a danger of being overshadowed by him? Um, I think there's always a danger of being overshadowed. Uh, the thing is, I, th I suppose you just rely on the lighting man and hope he can light shadows. <laughs> Um, it's, it's not something you worry about, and especially in a two-man piece. There must eventually come a time when uh, you get your own sort of turn, and then it's very nice to have someone like Lord Olivier off camera. Roy? Roy? Did, have you got the glasses, or have I? He was cast first and was asked who he would like to play the part, and um, he, he said me. I mean, I suppose, presuming that I wouldn't overshadow him. <laughs> Laurence Olivier would enjoy other successes in the 70s, with The Boys from Brazil and Marathon Man, his role in both earning him Oscar nominations. Another landmark was his 80th birthday. Amongst the celebrations was a pageant hosted by the National Theatre, and news and television tributes looked back on his life and his work. He was to show his genius again when he turned to television. The boy here. Yeah? Yes, Jay, he's here. Hmm. Don't let anyone ever deceive you into believing that the world was created in six days would you like your copy now, dear? The evolution of the horse was the most tortuous process. His coffee's frozen like a sort of arctic mud. Shall I make you some fresh, dear? Oh, rather like it. In recent years, Lord Olivier battled cancer and heart disease. Each performance was a triumph over physical hardship. But as he approached his 80th birthday at his Sussex home, his main concern was, of all things, the sudden onset of stage fright. I've suffered for the first time in my life from stage fright slightly, and that, um, that is a worry. I'd say most people get over that when they're about 17, but I never was frightened about anything when I was 17. I, all the time until now I'm, you know, Whatever the hell I am, what am I, 77? 80. 80. Mm. Um, I begin to be a little nervous of personal appearances. It's not only vanity, because I know I'm not very pretty, uh, but it's, um, it's, uh, I don't know what it is. I really can't account for it. I, I think it's, um, it's just um, one of those naughty things that uh, nature does to one, trips one up, just when I was least expecting it. Staunchly supportive of his wife's acting career and those of their three children who followed them into the profession, Lord Olivier once said his aim was to make the audience believe. As tributes pour in from the arts world, it's clear he succeeded as few actors have. God bless you, old cock. God bless you. And you. Not surprisingly, 
Laurence Olivier acted right to the end. His final performance was in Derek Jarman's War Requiem. A year later, aged 82, he died at his home in Ashurst, West Sussex, with wife Joan Plowright and his family of beloved children by his side. His passing prompted tributes from across the globe, acting colleagues saying his death marked the closing of a very great book. Laurence Olivier left a towering legacy. Not just in performances, but also in the concrete walls of the National Theatre, of which he was the first artistic director. The announcement that his ashes will be buried in Westminster Abbey was a final, powerful indication of the high esteem the nation had for him, and recognition of his devotion to his art and his enduring status as the greatest actor of his time.